Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final day of the 2024 Grad Futures Forum, a graduate student professional development conference hosted by the Graduate School at Princeton University. My name is Sonali Majumdar, and I am the Assistant Dean for Professional Development at the Graduate School. Thank you for joining us for the fifth year of this annual conference designed to support graduate futures at Princeton and beyond. In addition to Princeton graduate students and alumni, we've traditionally opened this conference up to the broader graduate community. We are delighted to welcome guests from over 70 institutions across 13 countries who will either engage live or access recordings of this session. This year's theme is building clarity, confidence, and connections. And I know this next session will help you reimagine these important areas through the power of creativity. It's my absolute honor to welcome you to this session of Grad Futures Forum on Night Science, Creativity in Scientific Research by Dr. Ethai Anai and Dr. Martin Letcher, the co-founders of the Night Science Movement. It's been an honor collaborating with Ethai and Martin to bring the concepts and tools of night science to the Princeton community. And we look forward to them sharing it more broadly today. This event is co-sponsored by the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. Thank you to Anne-Marie Maman, Executive Director of PEC, for championing and advancing creativity and entrepreneurial thinking among, among the Princeton community, particularly our graduate students and grad alums. At this time, I invite Camila Lorena Olivera, graduate student in civil and environmental engineering and Grad Futures Professional Development Associate to moderate this session. Over to you, Camila. Thank you, Sonali. So a first few housekeeping items first. This talk will be recorded. There will be really opportunities for Q&A at the end. We request that the audience adds their questions in the Q&A tab. Our speakers will either address them live or in the tab them itself. It's my honor to introduce today's speakers, Professors Itai Yanai and Marian Letcher. Dr. Itai Yanai is a professor of biochemistry and molecular pharmacology at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, where his team studies dynamic biological processes through the lens of gene regulation and systems biology. His work has led to many contributions in the field studying the evolution of developmental gene expression programs, spatial and single cell transcriptomics, cancer cell states, and tumor heterogeneity and genome, genome evolution in the genetic basis of genotypes environment interactions. Dr. Martin Lecher is professor in the departments of computer science and biology of Heinrich Hein University in Dusseldorf, Germany. He heads the computational cell biology research group, which explores the molecular organization and evolution of cellular systems, in particular metabolism. Their major aim is to understand design principles that arise from the optimization of complex systems through natural selection. The group builds and analyzes mechanistic models of biological systems, which are firmly grounded in physical and chemical descriptions. Combining these models with numerical optimization, evolutionary simulations, and biological data that allows them to test ideas about the evolution of bacteria and plants. Dr. Lecher and Dr. Yanai co-authored the popular science book, The Society of Genes, which discusses how genes compete and cooperate in our genome. Their friendship and collaboration has also brought us the Night Science Initiative, which discusses the exciting and significant parts of scientific research that occur behind the scenes and explores the creative side of scientific thinking through workshops and courses, editorials in genome biology, and the popular Night Science podcasts. Thank you for giving us a glimpse into the Night Science world, Dr. Lecture and Yanai. Thank you, Camilla. We're uh, very pleased to, to be here. And thank you also, Sonali, for opening the session. Uh, Martin and I are, are delighted to be here today and tell you about the uh, creative side of the scientific process. The notion is that you know we're brought into this scientific endeavor and we're taught very well how to test ideas using the scientific process, but precious little about how to come up with those ideas in the first place. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to give you a framework for thinking about how the creative process fits into the greater scientific research process, and also a set of thinking tools to get you started. So uh, as Camilla uh, introduced, my name is Itai and I am a professor at, at NYU. I've done my undergrad in engineering and the philosophy of science, but ever since my PhD, I've been in biology. I did my 
PhD in bioinformatics. I did a postdoc at the Weizmann Institute and at Harvard. Uh, and today I do uh, the research that you described. And Martin, over to you. Yes, well, thanks uh, to, uh, um, to you as well for having us here today to talk about night science. Um, my name is Martin Lercher. I'm, you know, as has been said, professor at Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf in Germany. My undergraduate training was actually in physics and also my PhD was in theatrical physics. But I decided that there were more interesting questions in biology. So uh, I switched over to, to doing that. So, you know, if any of you is woken up in the middle of the night and being asked, how does science work? Probably you're going to have a good answer to that. And the answer likely will look roughly like this. There's a problem. You have a hypothesis about how to solve the problem. And then you do some empirical tests. You collect some data. Maybe you do an experiment. And you see, is the result compatible with your hypothesis? And if yes, you have an answer. If no, you have to change the hypothesis. So that's how science works. And there's good uh, philosophy behind that. You know, us scientists, we know very little about philosophy. But if there's one philosopher we should all know, it's Karl Popper. Karl Popper had this brilliant insight that what we should do when we have an idea is not try to prove that it's true. If you think about it philosophically, you can't prove that anything is true. What you can do, though, he said, is try to disprove it, try to falsify it, show that it's not true. And then over time, if we have many ideas and we just get rid of all the ones that are wrong, we will be left with, Karl Popper supposed, just the correct ones. And so you can think about it that this means that there's a, a, a strong philosophical underpinning to what we should do in science. We should have our ideas and then we should test them. Uh, the thing is though, uh, is that really how science proceeds? Well, maybe, and maybe to some extent. So this is a picture of Itai and me in our favorite place in Heidelberg. Yeah, it was just um, a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually you know, we, we would love to have a picture from the original project that we did at that place in, in a coffee shop. Um, but uh, we don't have pictures from that time. It was a long yeah, was, time ago. and It was 20 years ago. Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah, it was 20 years to go, uh, ago today. So... Um, Itai and I had worked on a paper together and we had used some very interesting data and we knew there was a lot more stuff we could do with that data. So we met with our laptops at the cafe and also at other places in Heidelberg to work on that project, right? And we had, we had a hypothesis or at least an idea and then we did some statistical tests and, you know, we implemented them on our computers, we ran them, we got a result. Yeah, we wanted to test the idea. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so we wanted to do everything what we knew how science works. But the thing is, often the result was not compatible with anything that we would have expected, right? It was, it was neither a yes or no, it was something totally different. And it was very confusing, right? And there were points where we didn't even know anymore what was the question that we were trying to answer, right? So there were these times when we did what was supposed to happen, right, according to Popper. But then there were the other times where we were totally confused and kind of lost. So it felt like it was a failed project. Yeah, and then after a while, we realize a pattern. We go from project to project, and the same thing happens. In every project, there is this period of confusion. There is this period that just is entirely not discussed when we think about it from the point of view of, of Popper, where we should just be having ideas and trying to disprove there. There seems to be something else. So how could we capture that's something else. Well, somebody who wrote about that was uh, François Jacot, um, who got the Nobel Prize um, to, as a co-discoverer of the principle of gene regulation. And he wrote an autobiography. And in that autobiography, he describes that science in the works has two aspects, what could be called day science and night science. And day science is what uh, Sir Karl Popper talks about. It's how you test your ideas. That's day science. Mm. But then there's also that other side. Yeah, what is that other side, Martin? Well, the other side is, of course, what you could call night science, right? It's sort of the, the flip side. And the way Jacot describes it in his book is night science wanders blind. It hesitates, stumbles, recoils, sweats, wakes with a start, doubting everything. It is forever trying to find itself, question itself, pull itself back together. 
Night Science is a sort of workshop of the possible, where what will become the building material of science is worked out. So it's the creative process in science. That's the, the hidden part of the scientific method, where you work out what will become the building material of the new science. So, so Martin, you're saying that, that Jacob says that there's a day science component where we're testing ideas, and then there's a night science where we're coming up with the ideas. But how do those two in, interact? Like, do, do each of us have both of these modes going back and forth? What, what happens? Well, actually, you know, there's, there's, there are two sides of the same thing. They're like yin and yang, right? There's the day part where we test things, like where we're in a narrow part of science, right? Where we just make little steps to see if the hypothesis works. But then we move over into the night science area where we can make much larger movements, right? We can think by association. We can use our feelings to guide us and say, let's look in that corner, right? Like maybe there's a connection here. Um, and then we have to move back into the day part to test our ideas. So we constantly move from one side to the other side. Sometimes, you know, within the same sentence, we can move from day signs to night signs and back to day signs. Yeah, like we pop out of the experiment and we're now in this night science world, night science world where ideas are connected and we think, what does it mean? Maybe we're seeing something here, even though it's in the context of molecular biology, that's actually related to a totally different realm in chemical biology. And then we, we might be able to then make a quick jump to a whole different field and then pop back in there to do the right experiment in that particular setting. So is that something that Francois Jacot invented? Well, you know, I, I think we give him a lot of credit. Uh, really, this is an observation that's been found time and time again. Uh, if you think about it, it's really revealing of a very deep dichotomy. So, for example, if you think about psychologists, they don't call it day science and night science, Martin. They call it divergent thinking. You're coming up with many new ideas. And then convergent thinking, where you're picking on one and going deep diving into it to, to uh, figure it out robustly. That sounds a lot like to us, uh, day science and night science. Ooh, did I do something? Okay, we're back. What about ancient philosophy? You did mention yin and yang already, Martin. Yes, yes, I did. Well, of course, I mean, the, the idea that, that things often have two sides that are complementary is, is, of course, a very old idea. Um, but it's also something that, you know, again, in psychology has been also viewed from a different angle by Daniel Kahneman and his co-worker into system one thinking, which is um, intuitive, emotional, instinctive, and system two thinking, which is rational and logical. Which would you say is day science and which would you say is well, night science? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, system two is day science, right? It's when you're testing, when you're making sure it's true. Right. System one, you know, when you're coming up with new ideas, you know, that's that's night science. Yeah. Well, what about statisticians? You know, uh, st if you think about what to do with a data set, there are two modes. There's the detective mode where you're going in and, and you're trying to figure out who did it. Was it the butler who did it? Let's collect evidence. We're looking for different kinds of uh, pieces of evidence. Now you have the evidence. You turn them over to who? To the judge, of course, you present them with the p-value, the statistical rigor, all the controls that you did. So the detective and the judge analogy in statistics, that seems to us exactly like night science and day science. And what of course, what we're talking about in, in, in some sense is philosophy of science, right? And philosophers of science have talked about this for a long time. And they talk about the context of discovery. That's night science. Right. And the context of justification, right? It's the judge who has to decide is the hypothesis defendable or not? So this is such a deep dichotomy, this executive mode of day science and creative mode of night science. Would you say, Martin, it even extends deeper beyond the sciences and into the arts? Well, surprisingly, creativity is also a part of many other occupations. It's not only found in science. Yeah. For example, in the arts, in music, um, there's day music where somebody like Taylor Swift would be on a stage and um, and execute a song that she's rehearsed and everybody in the band knows what to play at what point in time. But she had to come up with that music in the first place, right? She had to have some idea of 
what emotion do I want to do, sing about? Like what words could go with that? What melody? Um, so that's the night music part. And in uh, the, the, uh, in the visual arts, um, this day art where you put um, your, um, your pencil or your brush to, um, to, to the canvas, that's day art where you execute. But night art is when somebody like Frida Kahlo had to think about, you know, what do I want to express with my painting? And yeah. what composition could, have, could the painting have? So this dichotomy is shared between all creative human endeavors. I mean, amazing, right? Because that, that means that we're artists too. Like when we go into science and we do a project, we're essentially acting like an artist. Like we're trying to find something that just doesn't exist yet. I mean, maybe it exists, but we don't know it exists and we have to figure it out. And that's exactly what the creative side of the scientific process is. And, and Martin, you and I, we've been talking about this for quite some time, right? We've been uh, uh, thinking about how the two sides of the process are really like two minds, right? You have the mind, the, the brain, the way of thinking, that's like a day science thinking. And that's a kind of hard thinking, uh, whereas there's another totally different kind of mind that we switch into called night science mind. And that's a very different, complementary, opposite in many ways. For example, in the day science mind, you're like Popper. You're trying to be very critical. You know, when the scientists, when, when people on the outside, they ask, what are these scientists thinking? What they expect us to be is very much into the critical, you know, robust kind of thinking. That's day science mind, where we're testing hypothesis. We're working within our discipline, using precise language, looking for consistent, robust answers testing a particular solution and designing experiments. But then there's the night science mind that's, night science mind that's very complementary. It's improvisational. So, yeah, go on. Exactly, right? So in the night science, um, we have to be improvisational, right? It's not just about falsification. It's about getting new ideas. We yeah. have to generate hypotheses. And often we do that by jumping between disciplines, by pulling in ideas from other areas. Um, our language is different because... In night science, you know, day science we have to be precise. Night science we can talk whatever way we want. We can use metaphors, analogies, and maybe they'll give us ideas. We have to find new questions, and often we find them from contradictions. We have to switch between different angles of looking at a puzzle, and the process is not designed. It's something that evolves at the beginning of, the, of a process of a, at a project. Um, we have no idea where the project is going to go. Right? Yeah, it's, and you know. It, yeah, it's open. It can it can go anywhere. And in our uh, experience, we teach graduate students very well how to think in a day science way. No one is concerned about this kind of teaching. This is very much in the curriculum. But Martin and I, we think that there's a big chasm when it comes to discussing the night science mind. We simply do not receive this kind of training. And it's very unfortunate yeah. because anyone can get better at it. And so what Martin and I have been doing with the Night Science Initiative that Sonali described is writing about this and coming up with thinking tools that we can describe and teach to people. And we'll summarize it for you. If you're interested in anything that you hear about here, what should they do, Martin? Well, well, first I would like to emphasize what, what you said, right? Like we're taught about day science. We're not taught, taught about night science. And, you know, there's two reasons. One reason is uh, either you have it or you not, you don't, right? Either maybe, you're creative or you're not creative. Yeah, maybe you right? can't teach this stuff, Martin. You can't teach it, right? That's what many people think. And also, you'll have to pick it up on the way, right? I also picked it up on the way. Nobody taught me, so why should I teach you? But, of course, that's wrong, <laughs> right? We know, it's, we know you can get better at this game. And we know that we should help you to do that. Exactly. And one way we try to help you do that is we wrote a series of editorials in the journal Genome Biology, and we're going to talk about a lot of the stuff there very briefly today. Yeah. But we didn't yeah. stop there, did we, Itai? No, we also have a podcast where we talk to scientists and ask them, what are the thinking tools that they use to get ideas? How do they do it? Uh, a kind of behind the scenes look at how science happens. And, and what we hear there is just extraordinary. There are so much shared wisdom, I think, that gets imparted on this podcast. So 
uh, Martin, wouldn't we encourage them to check it out? Would it kill them to check it out? Yeah, would it kill you to check it out? I, I don't think it would. I don't think it would. So, so Itai, you know, beyond just realizing that there is this dichotomy, that there are these two processes, what would you say is the most important thing um, to improve your own access to your creativity? Yeah, the number one thing is you need someone that you can talk to. Why is Why? that? Well, you know, a lot of times if you ask me, Itai, what are you thinking? I don't know what I'm thinking. I only know what I'm thinking. Have you had this experience also that you only know what you're thinking when you say it to a friend? Well, sometimes I even realize I don't really know exactly what I'm thinking, but I know the direction I want to go in with my thinking. Right. And it's it's the the conversation with a friend that brings it into focus. And I think the reason why that is, is our brains are such a complicated organs. And we have this three dimensional neural network that's so complex. But when we're forced to say something, it converts that into a one dimensional string. And that one dimensional string that thought now described as a sentence is so powerful. And, and so but then Martin, couldn't you say that you could if, if language is what's important here, couldn't they just write their ideas? Why? Why do we need to speak them to another person? Well, I think it would actually already help um, in some to some extent to just write it down. It's true. Right? And often when we when we start writing papers, we realize where the gaps are and we realize what else we need to do. But there's much more you can get, of course, when you talk to another person. You can pool your own experiences and your own knowledge about the scientific literature, for example. Right. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe there's a mistake you do in your line of, of logic. And then the other person can tell you, well, but you know, how do you make that step? And you'll have to think about that. Um, there's many things that uh, another person can do. For example, an important thing is also, if you talk to another person, that person can encourage you yeah. to follow a line of thought, even if it sounds a little bit crazy at first. Whereas if you're alone, maybe you'll stop yourself before you make that important step into a new direction. Yeah, so I think that's things. a major one. Yeah, I think you're right about that. It's That's a major um benefit is the encouragement you get that that if, in times when i haven't had someone that i could talk to the science really suffered for me what moves science along is a seemingly endless discussion but then that's martin nice. someone could say that well if you talk to one person can't you magnify the power of that notion by talking to many people yeah, get in a room with 20 people and start brainstorming. You do know, this thing called great? brainstorming. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why, why do you think that wouldn't work, Itai? Well, brainstorming, uh, now, now we run into a different problem. You know, we said that when you're alone, you don't know what you're thinking. You don't get the encouragement. So you need to be with people. But there's a different set of problems that come when you're in a large group. It turns out that when you're in a large group, a phenomenon called groupthink gets uh, in the way. Groupthink is when people conform to the group sort of thinking. Individual individuality is suppressed. And this was uh, actually quantified in a very famous experiment called the Ash experiment, where participants were uh, individually shown this line and asked, of these three other lines, A, B, or C, which is the one that's equal in height? And 99% of the people said C. And, we, and we're not quite sure what's going on with the other 1%. Uh, but then, Martin, what was the other way that they did the experiment? Well, you know, they, they paid some actors right, mm. um, who were sitting in the audience. But of course, the, the rest of the audience didn't know that they were actors, right? And the actors had been paid to say B. Right. So one after the other, they would say B, 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 B. And then the participants of the study were asked and one third of them would what? say B. Even one if third. had they been asked alone, they would have given the right answer. One right. third. So, and this is a case that's literally black and white what the answer is. So imagine with all the gray that's part of our everyday world, how we simply act as different people when we're in large groups. And so to be creative 
it may be beneficial, and there's a lot of other evidence that we're skipping over here to get this talk in a concise way, but there's a lot of evidence to, to show that uh, the more creative you want to be, the smaller the group size should be. And so... Yes. So, so large groups are, are, are good for some things. They're good for doing data science. They're good for developing some, some field, right? For adding data, for you know, solving some big question that's where it's clear how it's going to be solved. But if you want to get ideas, if you want to be creative, if you want to be disruptive, mm. it should be one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And, and what, what should the attitude be when we're doing this one by one? Well, um, you know, as the slide says, you have to think of the discussion as an improvisation. And here we borrow from improvisational theater, right? Where actors get on stage and they don't have a script. They have to develop the play as they're playing it. And that's kind of the same idea we have when we develop new ideas, right? We, we don't have a script of how we develop those ideas. We have to improvise. And the important thing is what is called the yes and rule in improvisational theater, which means that whatever the other person says, you're not allowed to say, no, that's bullshit, right? You can't say that. You can't say that's nonsense. You know, let's do something else. You have to say, yes, you have to have a positive attitude. And then you can say, you can try to add on that, right? And you can even say, well, it's very interesting. How does it relate to, you know, those results that have been published 10 years ago, right? Which, mm. you know, seem on the surface, at least, to contradict. And then you can see, you know, how can you make sense out of that potential contradiction, right? You don't have to agree with everything, just say yes, 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 yes. But you have to help the other person to develop an idea. Hmm. That's Mark, the attitude you, you do need. a uh, demonstration? Sure, sure. All right. Can someone in the chat please just put a word like pineapple or table, any word? Just put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. This is also a test if there's someone out there. Garage. Uh, garage, here you start. Ooh, books, rain. <laughs> yes, Mark, you yes. want to start? Uh, no, you start, you start. Uh, no, you know, I, I don't want to start. <laughs> you see, okay, okay, so, so that doesn't, that doesn't work. That doesn't, that doesn't work. work. Okay, let's do it again. How okay, about so, banana? so, you know, <laughs> you, you know, there's an elephant in the garage with uh, sunglasses who's watching a movie. There's an elephant in the garage with sunglasses who's watching a movie. Wow. I mean, that I, I think I saw that on Netflix once. Oh, you, think, you think they're filming the second part of the series? Yeah, yeah. It's season two. The first season was the New York Times surprise hit of the season. Uh, you know, what, what happened with that show is everybody thought it would fail. And, and so... Uh, the the people who are you know they, they did a whole story in the times about it it turns out it was just like these two teenagers and now they're overwhelmed with success and these teenagers don't know what to do with their success about the elephant in the garage show okay. so, so i think you'll get the idea right if if, <laughs> we, if you say no right if if i would have said there's an elephant in the garage and itai would have said no that's bullshit. there's no elephant in the garage right it doesn't go anywhere you have to have this positive attitude and you have to help the other person to develop the story. Exactly. And there's another rule that we take from improv, and that is make the other person look good. Uh, if you're watching the improv theater actors, the uh, other premise is whatever the person does is you need to try to make them look good. You need to, to uh, make them shine. And we want to demonstrate this for you first with a story. This is a picture here of the Miles Davis Quintet. And uh, Miles Davis is in the center playing the trumpet. Herbie Hancock is here on the left. He's on the piano. And he tells the story that once when they were in a concert, he played the wrong chord. Instinctively, oh, no. he puts his hands to his ears because he was just so horrified by playing the wrong chord. But you know what Miles Davis did? He paused because he registered that the wrong chord had been played. He might have been a little bit annoyed internally, but then this is what he did. He proceeded to play notes that made Herbie Hancock's wrong chord correct. And that's what you need to do. 
you have to understand that all of us have the imposter syndrome. All of us feel like we don't belong here. We all have insecurities and we all feel that we're constantly saying stupid things. And so if our goal is to come up with creative new ideas, what we need to do is create this sandbox setting where anything goes, where it's okay to, stay, to say stupid things. Most brilliant ideas actually start out as seemingly stupid ideas. And so it might sound counterintuitive. This is science after all, it's supposed to be serious, but actually it's this playful attitude uh, that's so important. So when the other person says something stupid, you go along with it. And, and remember uh, what uh, Daniel Kahneman said, Martin, when we talked with him and he said that, that when someone said something stupid, what would the other person say? Well, the other person would say, well, if he's saying that, there's probably something in there, right? Maybe yes. if the idea as a whole doesn't work, right? But there's something in there why he said that, and we have to figure out what that is. Exactly, exactly. And that's what you need to do when you're having these one-on-one -on -one improvisational discussions. And so you can understand that, that there's actually two modes here, aren't there, Martin? Yeah, so in day signs, it's all about falsification. It's what Popper tells you to do in science. But night science is improvisational, right? where you figure out new stories, new ways in which you could go. Hmm. Well, we want to tell you about another thinking tool. And maybe the best way to make it memorable for you is to tell you a story about Bob Dylan. So as many of you know, Bob Dylan bursts upon the scene in the early 60s by being a protest folk music uh, singer. He, he's, right, he's singing all these songs against the US involvement in Vietnam. And then seemingly inexplicably, he plugs in an electric guitar a couple years later and starts playing rock and roll. And effectively, he jumps right out of the genre. He was in the folk music genre, and all of a sudden, he's in the rock genre. His fans were confused. They were asking, what was he doing? Now think about it. Music has genres, and that's not very different from science, right? What, what does, Martin, science have that's an analogy to genres? Well, science has disciplines. Actually, you know, I realized that as another example, we could have talked about Beyonce suddenly making country music. That's um, true. That, maybe we need to reach the younger audience. By maybe. Keeping, I think, I think uh, you heard it here, folks, first. Uh, this was the last time we talked about Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we have something very similar in science. We don't have, uh, you know, musical genres, but we have scientific genres. We have uh, disciplines. We have faculties and departments, right? So for example, there's biochemistry and then another building there's biology, another building for chemistry, and then there's mathematics and computer science and physics. And you know, what we do if we get hired to those faculties is we go to the conferences for our people, right? So, you know, if I'm a computer scientist, I'll go to computer science conferences. I publish in computer science journals. I you know, submit grants to computer science panels. You know, everything we do in day science, at least, is determined by which department we are in. Yeah, it's a very fateful decision to, to decide what department you're in because science is so heavily uh, structured. And but I think not, you told this story about Bob Dylan, right? So what, what can we learn from him? Yeah, I think what you can learn is that while music has genres, musicians don't need to stay in just one genre. And it's the same thing for scientists. Just because science has different disciplines, different fields, does that not mean that you need to stay in one field. In fact, if you think that the next big idea in your field is going to come from within your field, you could be very badly mistaken. The next breakthrough idea in your field could come right from the outside. And that's what Bob Dylan sort of realized is that when he has something to express, when he has a, a sort of idea, like a night music idea that he wants to express, he can then pop back in 
to day music, but the right genre of day music to express that idea. He doesn't need to confine himself to just things that can be expressed in one genre. And that's the same thing with us as scientists. We need to follow the ideas. And if that requires us to go to a different discipline, then that's what we can do. And, you know, what's true in music is also demonstrably true in science. So many scientists were originally trained in a different field from where they made their big contributions. And here are just three examples. Mary Claire King, training in mathematics, contributed to human genetics. Francis Crick, training in physics, contribution to biology. Marie Curie, training in physics. Uh, she Picture got a Nobel Prize in physics, so no <laughs> surprise there. But she also got a Nobel Prize in chemistry, right? So, um, and actually, I think Itai is a, is a good example also of this trend, right? These are very famous people, right? Itai is only yeah, somewhat famous, um, but <laughs> no, but 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 it's you did a lot of cool famous stuff in my and, head. No, just, kidding. Huh? <laughs> just kidding. You did a lot of cool stuff, and and I think a lot of that is because you're not afraid to move into new areas of science. It took me a long time to to realize that that I need not be afraid. I think it took me a long time to realize that these fields that we describe, they are not real in the sense that nature recognizes them as real you know in a sense <laughs> nature doesn't come with labels these fields that we've designated that's humans doing that in a sense though there are no real boundaries between the fields you know nature is all connected and so while creating these fields it's from a night science perspective sorry from a day science perspective it leads to a lot of efficiency, right? That you can talk to colleagues in your department and, and you can uh, assume they have a shared knowledge base. You don't have to keep describing what DNA and transcription are every day to, to the person. But um, really there are ideas that can come from anywhere. And I think it, it, it's just a really crucial thinking tool that we can all use a lot. It's, it's a wonderful way to do science by keeping your ears open to what's happening in other disciplines and then importing the idea. So the notion of import from one idea, uh, from one field to another is really crucial. Yeah, and you know, here, here are some examples and we're only gonna talk about maybe just about one of them. Um, cancer is an evolutionary process, right? Cancer cells evolve inside the body, but that's something that was not obvious to cancer biologists. Um, 20 or 30 years ago. It's, it's something, somebody had to bring in evolutionary thinking into cancer mm. in order to, to gain that understanding, in order to understand, for example, how cancers become resistant against therapy. Yeah, so it's just a great way to do science. Like if you're studying how yeasts, how, how they interact, if you know also about game theory, that's uh, mostly present in the field of economics, you could import that idea, that notion about thinking of the different strategies of unique agents and how that plays out over time and say, hey, can I import that idea? Can I ask, do yeast cells play game theory and lead to a big discovery? So can you only import ideas? Well, there's also the flip side of that, that that's to export an idea that it could be that you're in the field that actually has this very powerful idea and you realize that you can take that idea that you know so well because it was developed in your field and now you yourself travel to other fields perhaps through collaborations that's a great way to get credibility in the field that you're going to you no longer have that credibility that you did before when you were importing and you were in that field uh, and and apply that notion to other fields. So this import and export, this taking ideas across fields, it's such a powerful creativity tool in the sciences. So, you know, what can you do to help yourself think across discipline boundaries? I mean, I think for, for PhD students, you guys uh, should become experts by day. Really know something very well. You're acquiring a language. That's what a field is. It's a particular uh, set of notions, the kind of language. Know that really well, but then don't be closed off listening to what's also happening in other fields. 
So that brings us to a little movie that we want you to watch. I'm going to play it. Yes. Usually we have to tell participants not to make noise, but here there's no problem since you're all muted. So you have to count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. So count the number of passes by the white team. Okay, how many passes did you count? The correct answer was 15, but did you see the gorilla? Let's rewind the tape. Did you see that a gorilla came from one side, got to the middle, pounded their chest, and then left on the other side? This is no, one the of the amazing most... thing is, is yeah. if, you, if you watch that video, and you're not counting passes, it's very hard to miss the gorilla. Um, but with this task, actually 50% of people don't see the gorilla, right? So if you didn't see it, you're in good company. Yeah, 50% of the people miss the gorilla because they were so hyper-focused on a particular task. And so we wondered, does this also happen in science when we're doing a project with a particular hypothesis in mind, do we also become blind to potential discoveries like a gorilla? So what did yeah, we do? How would you test that, Itai? Well, we, we came up with a, a fake data set and we gave it to a class of students that we divided into two groups. What did we tell each group? So one group, which we called the hypothesis focused group, we said, look, here's a hypothesis. The data is about body mass index and the number of steps a person takes per day. And your task is to test if there is a significant correlation between these two variables. And also you can tell us if there's something else interesting with the data. So that was the hypothesis focused group. And then we had a hypothesis free group, which we just told, uh, told you know, what can you deduce from this data set? So we had these two groups. Now, when, when um, you think about it, what does it mean that we said we created a fake data set? Well, we engineered, engineered it so that if you plot the data, X being the number of steps, Y being BMI, this is what you see. There's a picture of a gorilla that's waving at you that you see immediately when you plot the data. So really what we were wondering is who would plot the data? Because as soon as you plot the data, you see the gorilla. What we found is that the group that was given a hypothesis, analogous to counting how many passes the white team make, they were three times less likely to plot the data, and therefore they did not discover the gorilla. Can you imagine? Having a hypothesis is essentially what, Barton? Well, it's uh, a liability. It appears to be a liability to have a hypothesis. Of course, it's great to have a hypothesis, but it might prevent you from discovering something else. And in this case, it was very easy. All you had to do was plot the data, right? You had, the, you had to do the first step to explore your data set. But in real science, of course, it's going to be much more complicated to discover something, but you have to explore the data. And that has to be your attitude. Yeah, you have to have this attitude, this sort of conscious of this possible liability. You could say, well, there might be gorillas hiding in there. Let's explore the data. Let's compare everything to everything else. But wait, Martin, if we compare everything to everything else, aren't we liable to experience patternicity? This notion that the human mind can just see things that are not real. We're just imagining them, just like we see our pets in the clouds. Yeah, of, of course, if you, if you correlate 100 pairs of variables with each other, then five of them will look like there's statistically significant correlation between them, even if it's totally random, right? So, um, yeah, there is this problem with night signs, with the discovery mode, right? You might discover something that's not real. So, you know, how can you compensate for that? Well, 
Day science. Day science is the adult in the room. Day science is the one that once you have a pattern, if it seems interesting, it will test it. And so the two modes of thinking, this hard thinking of day science and this more soft thinking of night science, they really complement each other. We recognize they both have liabilities. Day science can miss the gorilla. Night science can see things that are just not true. Together, they complement each other. That's why when we're doing science, we really need both ways of thinking. Oh, Martin, can we pretend that I'm Einstein and uh, I'm coming to you now and I'm asking you, oh, oh, uh, you're, the pro you're my professor. And I'm thinking, oh, the way science is supposed to work is that the professor gives me a problem and I solve it, therefore making a discovery. So, Professor, uh, can you tell me what are the biggest open problems in physics today? The, the year is 1905, right? It's, it's actually 1900. And, uh, <laughs> you know, of course, of course, you're my least favorite student because you never come to my lectures because you think they're boring. Um, but I'm going to give you your answer anyway, right? I'm not, I'm not going to give you one problem. I'm going to give you three, mm. right? So the mm. first one is, um, how do we have to change our concept of time to get rid of a contradiction between Maxwell's theory of radiation and a thought experiment where we think about what would happen if we would parallel, if we would uh, travel in parallel to a beam of light at the speed of light? Mm, that's, that's the first question. That's longer. Right? How to change the concept of time? Second question um, How do we have to think about gravity as deformations of space and time? Brilliant. And the third one is, you know, maybe you've heard there are some inconsistencies in our concept of black body radiation. How can we get rid of those contradictions um, by thinking of the emission and absorption of light in discrete packages, right? Those are the three biggest problems. And I'm sure you're not going to be able to solve any of those, right? More, more talented people have tried, but, you know. So I take these questions that I was given by the elder generation, and then I go and I solve them, right? This of is course, how that's how science works. Yeah, it's the high road of science. It's predictable, it's problem solving, it fulfills knowledge gaps. It's uh, answering questions. Answering questions. Is, is that how we think it happens? Well, uh, how predictable is science? Well, pretty unpredictable, in fact, actually. So these are on the left, we have the five biggest open problems in the life sciences, as people post them in 1997. And on the right, we have the five biggest discoveries of the past 25 years listed in 2015. And, you know, if science was predictable, there should be a huge overlap between those two lists. But there's none. There's no overlap, right? So the biggest discoveries were not expected. They were not predictable. Science is not predictable. And so with, with Einstein also, uh, he was not actually given the question the the it was never predicted that this is going to be the discovery we have the question now someone's going to get the answer einstein's genius was actually that he discovered the question half and, and he did that by refocusing the question right Th yeah. There was this question, okay, there seems to be an inconsistency and the speed of light seems to be constant in different frames of references. That makes no sense. So, so that was the question, right? Like, you know, how can that be? That was right. a very general question. But he had to discover that to answer the question, you had to refocus it, right? So for years, he tried to change Maxwell's equations and he failed and failed and failed. It was very frustrating for young Mr. Einstein yeah. until he suddenly realized maybe there's something we have to do with time, right? And when he had the question, is there something we can do with time to solve this? Then he could answer it. Exactly. And, and so we have to uh, have a different model of what a discovery is. A discovery is not predictable. We sometimes like to think of uh, knowledge gaps where this brick wall is an analogy for our knowledge. Each brick you could think of as a kind of theory. And then we may be able to recognize that there's something here that we don't know. We know that we don't know this. So, hey, younger generation, come in and fill this gap. We sometimes think about science as proceeding, proceeding this way. 
It's not true though, and it's not helpful. What you have to realize is that what a discovery really is, what we all want is to discover an unknown unknown. We didn't know that we didn't know it. That's what a real discovery is. That's why science is unpredictable and we actually love it for that reason. So what is really a discovery, Martin? Well, a discovery is realizing that the world is not like we imagined it, right? Like we had this we had this picture of a neat brick wall with some gap and then we tried to fill the gap and we realized, no, it's not just a small gap we can fill. It's a whole chasm in the wall, right? There's there's so much more that we can find. So a new question, a discovery opens up the way for many more interesting questions. So the coolest thing you can do as a scientist is not so much answer a question, it's phrasing an interesting new question. Yes, exactly. And so we come back to where we started. We, we said that what, what is science? It's problem solving through hypothesis testing. Well, that's true. And that's what we're taught. The problem is that it's only half the story because the most interesting part, a full other half of the process is to come up with that question to begin with. And for that, you need a night science process. So we hope that, that what we've described today puts a label on something that we're sure you've uh, experienced this confusion part, this notion where you're, you're asking what, what's the question, what's the idea, that is night science. And we need to cultivate how we, we think about it. We need to develop our thinking tools. We can each get better at it. And if you're interested in learning uh, uh, more about it, there are, uh, there are papers that we've written um, do you want to take over here, Martin? Um, I was actually just reading the questions. They're very interesting. So we, we have to get to them soon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, to, uh, to take over, what we think is kind of what Ita already said at the beginning, that the creative process in science is not being taught in science um, currently or, or very little. And we have to change that. Science has, uh, it can be shown that science has become less disruptive over time. So the really new ideas have become fewer and fewer um, in relation to the amount of science that is done. And to make science more interesting, more disruptive, we have to be more aware of this flip side of day science, you know, of the night science part. And we think that's something that should be taught across universities to graduate students and to un anyone else interested. Yeah. So if you're interested in learning more about it, you can check out the pieces that, that we've written. You can contact us for more information. Of course, we've also uh, written another piece recently that suggests that uh, perhaps one reason why science has become less disruptive is that we're thinking in, in large groups. This is what we discussed before about improvisational science. Really, it takes two to, to think. And so uh, you can read more about this, this topic that we described before. And just to sum up, this is our last slide. What we've proposed to you is that a useful way of thinking about the creative process is that there are two minds at work. And we as scientists, we need to be good at both of them. It's actually the interaction between these two that constitutes good creative science. You need to have a day science component where you're able to execute an idea, to test it, have a really kind of precise and hard sort of thinking. But then there's the flip side, as Martin said, there's the night science part, and that's improvisational. It's interdisciplinary. You're trying to get the idea here using metaphors, contradictions, as the Einstein professor point, poised to Einstein. Contradictions are great. You're constantly asking yourself, Am I in the puzzle that I think I'm in? And also, you're allowing the project to evolve. So by putting a label on uh, these two modes of thinking in our work, we believe that we could do more creative work. So uh, th this brings our presentation to a close, and we're happy to take questions. All right.
Thank you, Dr. Zuna and Lesher for this wonderful presentation. I will go through the questions really quickly. Uh, oh, so we have our first question from, uh, from an anonymous attendee. I appreciate the emphasis on keeping the child alive within you with the concept of nine science, yeah. even if day science is the adult in the room. However, what I don't understand or has been touched upon until now is how do you maintain the balance between putting in efforts on your day science skills while not losing spending time doing night science, especially without a mentor to necessarily guide you for a bit. I mean, what do you, what if you get extremely good at flights of imagination, but not very good at day science skills, or even just academia related skills, which I tend to club together with day science. For people in academic research with imposter syndromes, it's hard not to spend more on the day science aspect. Hmm. Th yeah. That's such a wonderful question. I think it's a great question, and, and of course, it's very justified to, to ask those questions. And there's not extremely simple answers to that, I think. Um, actually, we've also, um, in the, the piece that we wrote about interdisciplinary science, um, about importing and exporting ideas, we also touch upon that issue, right? We, we believe that you can be a specialist in one field, right, with very little interdisciplinary knowledge, but you really know everything about one thing. And of course, it's tempting, especially if you're a young scientist, scientist, to feel that that's the way to go. But you're losing out on a lot of possibilities to be creative. On the other end of the spectrum, you can be extremely um, interdisciplinary. So you know a lot, a lot about many different things, but you're not really an expert in any of them. And then it's going to be very hard to, you know, to be taken seriously or to test your ideas. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, right? But that's not really a quantitative answer to your question. How do you find the balance? Um, yeah. It's something also very personal. Different people are more on the night science side and more on the day science side. But if you focus too much on one of those sides, you're going to lose out on the long term. Maybe not so much on the short term, but your science is going to be less interesting and less convincing. Yeah. So it's a difficult question. And you know, it's just do you have thoughts? Yeah, uh, I think a, some insight could come from the analogies we've that have been used to describe these two ways of thinking. So Jacob he calls it day science and night science. That suggests that there should be it should be half half. Uh, in Chinese philosophy, we talk about the yin and the yang, and the the balance between the two is what gives us stability. That suggests that you sort of need a healthy dose of both. If you go too much on one, that puts you off balance and vice versa as well. So uh, what we like to say is that you should be an expert by day and a sort of renaissance, renaissance mind by, by night. Um, I think there are periods in our career where we sort of need to execute. The postdoc stage is, is one like that. Uh, and so there could be periods where we're more day science heavy. I just worry that if we become entirely day science, there's no future. Because what is the future? It's to execute on the ideas that you come up with in night science. So I think we should all strive to uh, keep the flame alive of night science, go on the daily or at least weekly coffee uh, walk with a friend and talk science. And, and you know, maybe, oh, hopefully it's clear, but for us day and night in this context are just metaphors, right? We don't mean that you should spend the whole night just thinking about the creative side of science. That's um, right. It doesn't matter when you do that, but it's important that you do that. Exactly. Thank you for the answer. So we have another question from Deepthi. When it comes to performing science research, it's not just about having crazy ideas, but doing it within a limited time frame. And in this wonderful world of competition and limited financial assistance for the early career researchers, at least in the LDCs, are we really allowed to have a crazy idea and work on it? Are we really allowed to have a crazy idea and work on it? Well, you know, in my mind, academia is still the last refuge of the imaginative. If, if you can't work on a crazy idea in academia, where can you work on a crazy idea? I, so I, I, uh, I say absolutely. Uh, it's true that we have careers that we need to attend to. And so we have to 
you know, realize also what are the norms and expectations for us to move to the next stage. But I would argue that the two are not necessarily in contradiction. It's, it's not that if you do more night science, your career is harmed by it. I think just the opposite. The, the night science is the, the process where you're going to get this amazing idea, this crazy idea that the person asking the question uh, uh, should indeed be allowed to, to do. That's what's going to allow them to, to make a breakthrough, I think. So that is the path to break through disruptive science. Yeah, and Itai and I, we both love day science, right? Without day science, there would be no science. Um, and it can be a lot of fun to, to you know, analyze your data or to do the experiment. But, you know, we, all, we really love doing night science. We really love creative discussions. And if you don't allow those for yourself, you're missing out on a lot of fun of being a scientist. And, you know, why you're in science then? And then for time, we're just going to take two more questions. And then from Arup, do you think academia currently leans more towards supporting incremental advances rather than disruptive ones? Conducting disruptive science can be quite risky and may clash with the prevailing publisher parish model. Martin, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, um... I think having a cool new idea is really gonna gonna be good for your career, right? I don't think that people will um, not like that. On the contrary, if you do very predictable science, that's not really gonna impress people very much. I mean, maybe you, you did brilliant experiments and you showed it, you know, with so much more accuracy and people will appreciate that, but they will surely appreciate if you come up with something totally new. I can also add that on, on a personal level, uh, I have always told myself that if I just do good science, science that I'm passionate about, that I can't not do, I can't stop myself from thinking about this, if I just do that, it surely will work itself out. And maybe I'm hopelessly naive, maybe I don't know so much about the business of science, and there surely is one. That's something we didn't really address in this talk, the whole business of science. Um, but I just, I, I really uh, have to hope that either, either it does work itself out, or I guess I don't want to be a part of it. <laughs> okay, so a lot of questions keep coming in, but we only have time for one more question. So this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I read your article earlier about it takes two to think. I wonder if it makes sense to do so between a grad student and a mentor, PI or a postdoc, since as a student, you may end up relying on whatever the mentor says. Does it make sense to have three to think or even more? Well, actually, there are some scientists uh, who we've talked to in the podcast. I think they're a minority, but some of them think that actually three is a good number. Um, but I, th but I think it depends very strongly on who the people are and how they're able to talk to each other. I think it's more difficult the more people are there. It's possible, but it's just easier with two people. And, you know, from my own experience, a lot of, you know, the night science improvisations I do, I do with my students or with my postdocs when I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, right? So I think it's just a natural part of the mentoring process or of the guiding process that you do as, as the supervisor of a student to have those improvisational discussions. Um, yeah, so. But in addition to that, it also makes a lot of sense to have a science buddy who's more on your level, right? Somebody you can just, you know, very freely talk about science without any inhibitions and, you know, somebody you like to talk to and, and you find helpful for your own creativity. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, having a science buddy is crucial. Can your mentor, can the PI be your science buddy? I say absolutely yes. In fact, I think they, they have to be. And that's how students should choose their mentor. They should, when they, they interview, when they rotate in the lab, they should really see, can I improvise with this person? And if they can't, then, uh, yeah, you know, the, it's kind of unfortunate because that's a wonderful opportunity to have these imp, imp, uh, improvisational discussions. 
Great. So we're out of time for questions, but I want to thank Dr. Zunai and Letcher for this session, and now I'm going to pass it on to Sonali. Yeah, thank you, Camilla. Thank you, Camilla, and thank you. I echo Camilla in, uh, from all of us in thanking you and Itai and Martin once again for doing this uh, through Grad Futures, but today we've had a much broader audience. And thank you to all of our attendees who have still stuck around after the hour. Uh, we are going to share the recording with everyone um, and a lot more who have requested the recording. Um, the conversation about night science will continue. We've been working on how we can make it more open access, how these ideas can freely move around. Um, and we've been working with Etta and Martin at the Graduate School in Princeton on building online videos that can be shared hopefully in coming months um, more broadly across. Um, and with that, I would again um, thank you all for this session. And for the Princeton folks who are in the crowd still, please join us today in, a few, uh, in an hour um, at 12 um, on our next talk, which is on Bullies, Bystanders, and Brave Hearts by graduate alumna Amy Cuddy from Psychology, um, who is going to talk about her next book of the same name as the title. Um, and after that, our last session for the Grad Futures Forum is from World Economic Forum on actually talking about research networks and research connectivity and how import and export of ideas are happening through collaborations through their transformation maps. So come and join us to learn about that as well. Recordings will be shared with anyone who's requested for those. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And Itai Martin, that you might want to look at some of the answered questions in Q&A. The first few were comments, which were just kind of really amazed at the ideas. And mm. thank you for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, and see you next month, Sonali. See you.